Jack. So, as someone just said, you might wonder why this talk is necessary given that OCaml programs never go wrong. Right? <laughs> type checks, nice strong typing. Um, unfortunately, experience shows that this is not quite always the case. It might be Friday. Um, so, I tend to end up with a certain amount of debugging of some fairly large scale OCaml programs at work. And I think it's fair to say there's a certain amount of folklore surrounding what happens when I'm given one of these things to look at. And I'm going to sort of go through a few things that might be helpful if you do have um, sort of seriously large OCaml programs to debug or ones that do, you know, complicated interactions with the system in some way. Um, and a few sort of common scenarios of sort of annoying modes of failure of OCaml programs and how you might sort of catch them. Feel free to, to ask questions along the line. So, you have a program with a bug. The 90% you know, the, the of bugs, the best thing to do is just to use printer. It works quite well on the basis that you can put it wherever you want. Um, you can express, you know, arbitrarily complicated conditions as to when you want to see the output. Um, you know, you can capture output without stopping the program, which might be important. Um, but I think a lot of the a lot of this talk is concerned with sort of bugs that might happen, say, in some production system where it might suddenly fail sort of completely asynchronously. You know, it might be something that happens very rarely, um, but, you know, the consequences might be quite bad, so we'd like to get rid of it. So one important thing for this sort of work is, you know, if something like this fails, actually, like, you know, um, try and use sort of standard Unix tools, sort of forgetting about the OCaml part for a moment. You know, many questions that you might want to know during the course of debugging can be answered by sort of quick and dirty things, like this, for example. You might have some, some client application connecting to a server, and you know you think it's connecting to one place, but it actually seems to be connected to somewhere else. If you use S-Trace, then you can see sort of the trace of all the system calls it's making and just look for a particular one. Um, you know, which files it has open, LSOF can resolve that. Things like running out of file descriptors, <coughs> opening the wrong files. Um, and strings is a surprisingly useful program as well. So if you take a binary file and run strings on it, then you get a lot of crap on 90% of the lines, but some of them will contain like all the string literals from your program, which is very good for checking, you know, in case there's been some build system error, for example, and a stale object file has, has got linked in or something like that. So assuming that um, we need sort of more, more serious attention than this, um, one thing that's, that's again often forgotten is actually just like look around the machine, things like disk based memory, system logs, you know, any other monitoring systems you might have, because sometimes these things are just triggered by, you know, someone forgot to check the return code from some system call, the disk is full, you know. Um, so, one thing that's sort of a camel specific thing, if you want to sort of trace what's happened when a program has failed, this is a camel run program variable should, it's a sort of list of key value pairs almost, or keys of characters. If you have B in here, then you'll actually get a proper backtrace when there's a failure. Um, and you should also enable core dumps. If you run a production system without this, and something fails, well, you may well have no evidence as to what's happened at all. Um, they can be quite big, you need to make sure you've got enough disk space, but you, know, you can tell the system, go and put them in this directory. Um, and if you're having anything to do with C stubs, you, this is, Another thing, make sure you compile with debugging info and with no optimization. Optimizing compilers confuse debuggers quite badly, and it may not always be obvious that, for example, the value of a variable you're looking at in GDB is actually wrong because it's got confused about where it is due to some optimization. So, contrary to common belief, GDB does work with OCaml native compiled programs. So, everything in this talk is basically about native code. So Fabrice and others have done some sterling work for version 4 where if you ask for a backtrace in GDB or want to know the location of something, source files, line numbers and function names and so on, that should be much better. Um, one thing that still is, is sort of outstanding is if you look at camel function names, you know, you might have a nice list or iter function. In GDB it appears like this. There's this camel prefix and then the module long name where the, the dots have been replaced by double underscores and there's some sort of extra mangling to disambiguate things on the, on the end. 
But in GDB, you can tab complete on these names if you ever need to type one. So you can narrow it down pretty quickly. So GDB is not very complicated to use, and there's just a few commands that can be really useful. You can either run GDB with a sort of full command line, if you use minus R, so everything from here onwards is the actual thing to run. So these are arguments to your program, not GDB. Or you can attach to a running program, which is also very useful. So you can attach to a program, poke around at it, and then detach it, and it will just carry on, you know, hopefully, pretty much as normal. So there's commands to sort of run and continue running after you've stopped. Set a breakpoint somewhere, so when we hit a particular function or line, then it will stop in the debugger. Um, BT will produce a backtrace, i.e. all the functions that have called us up to this particular point, and you can prefix it with this little rune, which will do the same for all, across all threads. Various other things are sort of values of memory. Uh, GDB help is quite good. If you do Apple Po and then some word, it will actually basically search its help for that word and will come up with you know, reasonable suggestions as to what commands you're looking for if you don't know what, what the exact name is. Okay, so one thing you might want to do is just to stop the program at some particular point. So this can be quite difficult because it might be a complicated condition. You know, it might be a loop that gets executed 10 million times and you want to stop on some particular iteration. Um, and it's doubly difficult in OCaml because <coughs> even with a new debugger work, you can't really sort of examine OCaml values properly. You have to do it sort of manually. Um, so a good trick is as follows. So this is a function that's easily, um, easily writable. This is the version that's available in core. So instead of setting a breakpoint, you can effectively sort of set a breakpoint yourself by just saying, when I get here, we're just going to stop the current process. And then you just wait until it fails, it just stops, and then you just attach the debugger, um, and then you can poke it. And it may be difficult to resume at this point, but hopefully you've managed to get some information. So I put this slide in for sort of, you know, it's sort of good for the soul to know this sort of thing. Um, although version 4 is sort of hopefully alleviating the need for this. So, you know, if the backtrace in GDB looks bogus, which it often does before OCaml 4, it, it's probably very short or it might have functions in it that you don't think you've actually called up to the current point. Well, I mean, so this is on a 64-bit Intel machine. Um, you can ask GDB just to dump the stack, right? So this is increasing address. And on these machines, the, the earliest point in the stack is at the highest address. So this is earliest call point going downwards. And you can just look for things that look like addresses. So these are actually read like this. It's read from here, and then it's read across here. They're sort of transposing like that because of the word order. Um, and you soon get a feel for some of these things, right? This address here starts with some fairly high thing. And if you look at your code with the object up in your executable, you look at all the addresses of the functions, you'll see that they all have addresses that are comparatively low. In particular, the top half is always all zero, almost always. And so then you can sort of just trace back down and you see, well, these two look a bit suspicious. And in fact, if you look at this address, you'll see this occurs in this function. So this was a list.iter. No, I mean, it's still a bit rough and ready. Yeah. Um, is that really good with address space randomization? Um, yes, but I think... Um, <coughs> or if you see really random numbers? I don't think for... Yeah, so for the main code segment, I think it's okay. Really? Okay. Yeah, actually, that's one thing to know. If you, can, if you are able to affect the setting of this in your machine, address-based randomization does disrupt, um, in particular, whether you get nice stack overflow exceptions or not in OCAP. It's arguably best to have it off if you don't need it for security. Yeah. Uh, just a note that the uh, GDB already knows the address is a function, so we just can use the info address. And the oh, I'm sure there are other ways to do it. Yeah, I always do it because I normally have the source next to it, that's all, but yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, also use, uh, you can also use A instead of X, and then it will uh, so try and solve the circles. It, yeah, pointers yeah. and try to decode them as symbols. So it's yeah. a bit easier. For the, yeah. You can get force positives too, things that look like both pointers. Right, sure, no, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I think what would be useful uh, would be the C command line in the Yes. It's really called C fields. 
So I was hoping to actually fix GDP to understand the camera of mangling. I think that's fairly easy. Um, it needs to know that it's a camel sort of object, but after that, it's easy. Okay, so some other sort of ones that are typically quite um, frustrating. Programs that fail with random exceptions, not, fact, not found, for example. Um, if you set a camel run plan correctly, you should get a backtrace. Um, you know, not, not having top-level side effects is a good thing, because it tends to stop the particularly bad case where it, the program stops with an exception before it's done anything at all, seemingly. Um, so one way you can catch this is, it, I'll, I'll put these slides on the web so you can remember the names, but this place will basically allow you to catch it just before the runtime prints the exception and quits. And a similar case um, is uh, an exit from the program without an exception at some random point. Perhaps you have linked with a library that likes to exit. I actually saw a library recently that just like exited randomly upon some error. And again, if you break in a, in a particular place, then you can, you can stop it before it's gone. And another thing I haven't tried yet, that um, GDB can actually do reverse debugging on x86 platforms. So you can do sort of similar to the bytecode debugger. You have to sort of run the program with this specific target, and it sort of records the trace in some way, but then you can actually go back and forth, apparently. So someone mentioned, I think in one of the cock talks, that they had trouble with things like this, which is you might not have an exception that sort of comes out correctly at the end. It might be that some exception has happened in the middle of a program, it's been caught, something else has happened, and it sort of then triggers another one, but you've sort of lost the original flow of the exception. So one thing we provide in core is, it only works on 64, but x86 at the moment, although it could be ported, is... Um, a means of actually getting the backtrace sort of right now, and you get a proper backtrace, um, including like bits through the C code, and you can just turn that into a string, and you know, you might wrap that up in some, inside some sort of error result or something. And also, if you're in GDB, you can call this function, assuming the program's still running, and you know, you'll get a proper So the one thing that a lot of people think cannot happen to OCaml programs is segfaults, which is wrong. Um, so a segfault is just a bad memory access, and when one happens on a, at least a modern Linux machine, you should, um, you should get something like this actually in the system log, which is a good place to look. If a program has vanished, um, you should look in there, because there might well be something like this. So you have the process name, ID, and various things, in particular in yellow, um, where the instruction was that actually caused the failure. And one of the most common causes of this in OCaml is stack overflow in native code. It does not always give a proper exception, so it's not really possible to do so precisely. Um, so it might be you just need to increase the stack limit very slightly. Some systems have quite conservative user U limits for the stack. Um, if you do a backtrace and it's actually a genuine sort of non tail recursion problem, you might see sort of hundreds and hundreds of stack frames that all, all look exactly the same. Um, bad C bindings cause similar, similar sorts of problems. If it crashes inside the garbage collector, then it's probably a faulty C binding. It's sometimes a stack overflow because you can sort of get just to the stack limit in ML and then flip over into the garbage collector and then it fails. But most of the time it's faulty C, and it might even just be hardware failure. If you look at the message and the, it says that you know the faulty instruction is at some enormously high address, for example, it's probably, you know, it might just be a hardware fault. Mark, can you just once just uh, um, the race condition leads to a safe fault? This is what... Yes, so, yes, in fact, OCaml's Q mode is that, yeah. Yeah, I'm saying. So you can get an actual safe fault. Yeah. Another sort of similar um, thing with threading, deadlock sort of programs just sort of sitting, doing nothing. In GDB, this is usually fairly obvious. See what all the threads are doing, and each is so you can see two threads, you know, each one's wasting the other's mutex. That's normally actually quite easy to, easy to find. Um, so, finally, just a short bit about C bindings because there's a certain number of these around. Um, the, the best way of debugging these, I tend to find, is just to read them. One of the, the usual problems is that you've forgotten to register a variable with the garbage collector, there's been an allocation, and then that variable's now no longer pointing in the right place. 
Um, so like, look for the allocation points. If you, if you um, release the runtime lock, you're introducing more <coughs> concurrency and more opportunities for the garbage collector to run, so you need to make sure that stuff's registered if you do that. You can use file grind to catch some of this sort of trouble, but unfortunately, if you sort of stomp all over the camel heap internally, <coughs> it probably won't catch it because it's all sort of in one block that it sees. Now, when writing C bindings, use sort of assertions to make sure that you think, you know, this thing really is a string, has got a string tag before you try and, you know, look inside it and stuff like this. Um, and if you don't need to release the runtime block, then don't, because you get less concurrency and probably fewer errors. Yeah? Uh, are you going to talk about the, the runtime variant option of the compiler? The, sorry, runtime. The runtime variant. So starting with OCaml 4, there's a runtime variant option to the compiler. So if you have installed OCaml with, uh, if you have configured OCaml with the with debug runtime, yeah. and you say with runtime variant D, then uh, you get the debug variant, debug uh, version of the runtime. Okay. And yeah. it does all kinds of checks on the OCaml. Right. Well, yeah, that's true. So when I said earlier, you can rebuild the runtime. That this basically performs the same thing. Like you get the one, you'll get a runtime with the symbols and sort of extra assertions and things that won't normally happen. So just finally, one thing on C bindings is that people often say, oh, if you use all these macros for registration correctly, and you hear this time and time again, then you know everything's fine. It's not the case at all. And in some ways, if you just do that blindly, you can sort of end up not really thinking carefully enough about what's going to go wrong. This this has certainly caught me. I don't know if anyone is familiar enough with this to see what's wrong with this apparently innocuous function. So this function just takes a thing that's expected to be a string, you know, gets the pointer out, calls some random C function without the runtime lock, because it's going to take a while to do it, and then returns. All fine, you think. Except that unfortunately, this actually points into this value. Strings are weird in a camel in some ways in that they're the one value where the data is actually, like a lot of data is actually in the value on the heap. Unlike a big string where it's somewhere else and you don't have this particular issue. So you have to be very careful because you can actually alias that data by doing an assignment to something that looks completely innocuous. The garbage collector will run, this will access file name it. And Okay, so yeah, I mean, I think the thing to the thing to take away is you can use sort of standard tools for OCaml. OCaml four is a lot better. And another thing, it might sound, sound kind of silly, but when you get some sort of complicated failure, people often like gloss over some little fact about oh, you know, and I observed this other thing that wasn't quite right, or you know, they'll have some sort of half explanation for a bug. But you know, there's a full explanation for every bug like, in the end of it. And until you've really got there and convinced yourself that you know you've sort of used all the information, you should be suspicious that you've really found what's wrong. Because you probably haven't. That's it. <coughs>